in the middle of a series on true worship. And God is really wanting to birth true worshipers in us and in this church. And it's exciting for me when he's speaking. I always want to hear what he's saying. I want to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Like um, Revelation says, I want to hear what the Spirit is saying. And um, I'm going to briefly rehash some of the stuff that we looked at very briefly. The first Sunday, which was last, not, not last Sunday, the Sunday before when we were looking at worship. And then we're going to look at... Um, some more stuff about worship today and really wanting to bring an understanding in terms of corporate worship, in terms of the purpose of it, in terms of um, what is our role in corporate worship. Okay, but first of all, I want to remind you of the definition of worship in Romans where I'm reading from the Amplified. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your lips of your bodies okay decisive dedication of your bodies presenting some of your members presenting just your outer shell but your mind is elsewhere presenting just your your lips and your outer shell but your mind and your heart is elsewhere does it say that no, what does it say? Presenting all your members and faculties, your faculties, your eyes, your ears, your thoughts, everything, your senses, as a living sacrifice. Do you know what a sacrifice is? You know what a sacrifice is? <laughs> it's something that doesn't necessarily want to be there, but it's offered anyway. Okay, so I come to church on Sunday whether I feel like it or I don't, right? It's a living sacrifice. We come and we pray at half past six whether we feel like it, whether we don't. Why? It's a living sacrifice. And when I come, I'm prepared to offer all of myself, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to man, to my husband, to you, to the worship team, to who? Okay, to God, right. So we come and we offer well-pleasing to God. And what is that? Our reasonable act of service and spiritual spiritual worship that's our reasonable act of worship and when i come i don't come rushing in still putting makeup on sit down oh where am i what are we doing again where no i prepare myself i come ready to offer a pleasing sacrifice to god when i come to church i come ready to offer that that's what corp that's that's corporate worship is a step up anyway that's our reminder that's my Reminder of what worship is about that worship. Can you remember worship is more than just singing songs? It includes singing songs, but it's much more than that, isn't it? Worship includes what what I do on a daily basis as I live my life How I am with my children how I am with my husband how I am in the school where I'm driving how I drive <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everything I do should be lived as unto God, not to man. Hey, that's what we looked at last time. So that's worship. That's my lifestyle of worship. Then on top of that, I have my intentional acts of worship, which is when I come before God with my Bible and I'm praying and I'm reading and I'm singing songs of worship using expressions of worship. Amen. That's also worship. But then when we gather corporately, whether it's in a go group, whether it's, yeah, sorry, the kids can go. I think we forgot to let the kids go. The kids can go. <laughs> whether we, when we gather corporately, whether it's in a go group or whether it's in church, that's also worship. And it's not only the singing songs part that's worship. It's the whole service that's worship because worship is about a revelation and a response. Revelation and response. So the songs that we sing need to give us revelation about who God is. That's the, so we can respond faithfully. When we do communion, that's worship. We're reflecting on God. We're responding to God. When we read the word, when the word is preached, that's worship. We're listening to God's word, not Tracy's word, not Paul's word. God's word. We're listening and we're responding, not to Tracy, not to Paul, not to whoever else is preaching, but to God, it's worship. So this is worship. Corporately, when we gather, our intentional acts of worship, when we read our Bibles, when we sing songs to God at home, that's worship. And our lifestyles are also worship. Is that clear? Great. So worship is all-encompassing. It's all-encompassing. 
And wor- God is looking for worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. You know, one of the things, I want to find out what God is looking for and I want to be that. I want to find out where God is looking and I want to be there because I want to be in the middle of whatever God is doing. And I want to know what he's saying. I don't know if that's the same with you. But I want to be the person that he's looking for. So God is looking for worshipers. And if we will be that, he will look for us and he'll find us. If he's looking for it, he'll find it. Amen. James Hughes has written a book on worship. And this is what he says about worship. Reformed worship must be explicitly theocentric, okay, theocentric about God. It must be God in the middle and everything else all around it. For worship to be fully theocentric, it must be three things. Number one, for God's glory. Man's primary purpose is to glorify God. Worship is ultimately the creature's bowing before the creator of the universe, acknowledging that he alone is worthy to receive glory and honor. So whether you're singing on stage, playing an instrument on stage, whether you're standing in your seats, whether you are welcoming people, it's before God. It's us offering ourselves before God for God's glory, not my glory, not that I can be seen, not that you can hear me play the piano, not that you can hear. No, it's not about me. It's about God. Whatever we do, it's about God. It's for God's glory. Number two, it's also for God's ministry to man. Man's secondary purpose is to enjoy God forever. And worship is for man's benefit and and enjoyment, but not his glory. In worship, we receive rebuke, instruction, comfort, encouragement from the word and the sacraments. What is all of that? That's revelation. We receive revelation and we respond and that's worship. So God uses these elements of worship as a means of grace to strengthen us, to enliven us in whom the Holy Spirit dwells and to prepare us for our mission in the world. If the elements of worship are not theocentric but human-centric, they lose their power. God is not acting, and they become not a means of grace, but of entertainment. Have you ever felt like that in church? We all come, we watch the singers, the singers do their stuff, we pay for the show, tithes and offerings, we watch the preacher, spits and whatever, whatever, and we've paid for our show, and then we go home, unchanged. It's powerless, it's meaningless, it's useless, really. It's not, it's not real. So worship is also it's for his glory, for God's ministry to man. And it can only be defined by God. It's defined by God alone. I can't define worship. You can't define worship. We can't say, well, worship for me is... No, that's your worship. But God's worship must be defined by God. God is the only one who can define what true worship is, since he alone knows what will bring glory to him and provide for our needs. Any definition of what true worship is must be derived from God. To be theocentric, worship must come not from man's will, not from man's desires, not from man's passions. It must be what God has defined it to be. And that's what we're going to look at today. Because we want to be worshipers who who worship according to God's principles. Okay, so the first thing that I want to look at, and I'm going to look at a few principles that will be a foundation for the, the about seven points that I'm going to make concerning congregational worship or corporate worship. And it's important. The first principle about worship as God has defined it is that when we worship, we must worship in spirit and in truth. We must worship in spirit and truth. John 4 verse 20 to 26. Jesus said when he was sharing with the Samaritan woman, he said, our fathers worshipped on this mountain and you Jews say, okay, this isn't Jesus, but anyway, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Now Jesus says to a woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the father. You worship what you do not know. Do you know who you worship? Do you know who you worship? Do you know the God that you worship? You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. 
So what does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? That's the next question. Well, worship in spirits can mean a number of things. Number one, it can be spiritual in nature. Okay, it can be spiritual in nature. In other words, it's not contained within the building, which is what we've looked at lo- last time. It's a lifestyle. It's spiritual in nature. It can't be contained, only happen in buildings that have stained glass windows and a cross on the front. Okay, it's not. It's spiritual in nature. It's not about a specific place. It's a sincere action of the heart toward God and can occur anywhere. All that is needed for spiritual worship to take place is the heart and the voice. The heart and the voice. Everything else is an enhancement of this. You see, I think what's happened in the church now is that we've replaced worship with music. We actually don't know how to worship without music. We don't know how to worship without a band. We don't. And we don't because we don't do it when we're at home on our own. We don't know how to do it. It's a lost, or it's becoming a lost art, or it will become if we're not careful. Okay? The heart and the voice need to be engaged, or the heart and the lifestyle need to be engaged. The other thing that spiritual worship, worship in spirit can mean, is that it must be done in the Holy Spirit. So the worship should come from our spirit infused with the Holy Spirit. Either singing out a new song, singing out a song of the Lord, singing out a song that the Holy Spirit has brought to mind, singing out or speaking out what He wants us to declare, or singing in tongues if you're baptized in the Spirit and you can speak in tongues. All of those things, singing in the spirit. You know, some, you know what often happens with our song list? Is we'll have prepared our song list like what happened this morning. We prepare our song list and then we start worship and the song list doesn't work. And it flies out the window. Why? Because we want to be more sensitive to how the Holy Spirit is leading us than according to our set song list of this praise song, then this worship song, then this. Because that's all fair and fine, but it's a relationship. It's about what's here in my Holy Spirit, what in my spirit, what the Holy Spirit is saying to me. That's what worship is about. It must be in spirit. It must be, it's a divine dance. You know a dance with when you're dancing with your spouse, you can't just you can't just go. And you've got your three steps and you're going and it's just, it's not the same. It's a relationship, isn't it? And he steers and you move with him and it's, and it's flowing and, and, and graceful. And that's how worship is. That's our, our expression of worship to God. It should come from our spirit. Worship and truth. What does that mean? Well, it means without falsehood. It means that I must be honest with myself and I must be honest with God. You know, if I walk in here and I've, got hangover and I've got alcohol on my breath and you know be let's be honest we don't need to put on a whatever your issue is I don't know what it is maybe you feel rejected maybe you didn't spend any time with God this week I don't I don't know we don't know where we've all come from we've all got stuff we all come out of the week but to be honest with God be honest and sincere not I give myself away and we sing this song and we're not even aware of what we're singing because we're on autopilot and we think that God can't see? Do we honestly think he can't see? Of course he can. He wants us to worship in truth. It's not for me. It's not for anyone else. It's for God. God can see. He knows where we've been. He knows what really is going on in our hearts and our minds. So it's not just an outward expression. But it's a connection between the heart and the mouth and the mind. And I'm engaged and I actually mean what I say. And if I mean what I say, one sentence in the whole of worship sung, meant sincerely, is a whole lot more powerful than five songs done brilliantly. Because God doesn't necessarily only listen to what comes out of our mouth. He's listening to our hearts. And I, I just feel like the, the heart of God, the cry of the Spirit right now, He wants this. He wants worship in truth. Worship in truth. To be true to what I'm really, where I'm really at. And I need to be honest with myself first. And then I can be honest with God. And then, yes, be honest about other people. It actually doesn't matter what other people think at the end of the day. What's the worst thing that can happen? They think you look funny. They walk out of here and they forget what you look like. <laughs> okay, so it needs to be worship in spirit and in truth. The second principle that I want to look at is worship must involve the participation of our entire being. Jesus said in Mark 12 verse 30, you shall love the Lord your God out of and with your whole heart. Will you read it? He read it with me. Out of and with your whole heart. Out of and with your whole soul. Out of and with your whole mind. Out of and with your whole, all of your strength. 
That's quite a, I mean, we could stay there for about a year trying to get that right. We could stay there for about a whole year. How would you rate yourself in terms of that? When you come to worship God in a corporate setting or when you offer your worship to God in terms of out of and with your whole heart, out of and with all of your soul, your whole life, with your, all your mind, your faculty of thought, your moral understanding, out of and with your whole strength. Now the problem I think we have is people literally, I think they take their mind or their brains out and they leave it at the door when they walk in. And we don't use our brains and our minds and we don't think and we don't grapple through things intellectually. It's important with all of our mind. If you love me, you'll do these things. And he says in John, if you really love me, you'll obey my commands. So we need to do all of these things as an expression of our love to Jesus. Okay. Now, congregational worship. This is the, the third point is congregational worship. When we come to worship as a congregation, it requires the participation of everybody. Of everybody. Just as the scripture I read just now said, when you love, you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, with your whole soul, with your whole mind, with all your strength. When we come in the same way, worship requires the participation of everybody. There's no such thing as a spectator in worship. If you're a spectator, you're not worshiping. If you've got enough time to criticize, you're probably spectating and you're probably not worshiping. Okay? Congregational worship requires the participation of everybody. Now, whether it's in our personal in, in times of intentional worship or in corporate worship, it requires everything. So everything of me there, everything of me here, and everybody here. And I'm not just talking about the singing part of worship either. I'm talking about the singing part of the service. I'm talking about the word. We're going to read now in Nehemiah, you know, how the people responded. They were worshiping with the reading of the word. You know, it's not like we do our thing, charismatic can-can for some people, and then we switch off. Or, and then we, now we don't respond because now the responding part of the service is over. Now we don't know. The whole of the service is worship. Nehemiah 8, if you've got your Bible, you can read along with me or you can read on the screen. Then all the people gathered together as one man. As one man, not as a man and then there were some stragglers. They were one man. They were all participating in the broad place before the water gates. And they asked Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had given Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly and all who could hear with understanding on the first of the seventh month. He read from it facing the broad place before the water gate from early morning until noon. Yo, some of us complain if the sermon goes longer than one hour. They read for you. They, he read from it from early morning until noon in the presence of the men and women of those who could understand. And all the people were attentive. All the people. If you're sitting in the congregation and you're not paying attention, whoever's standing up here can actually see whether you're attentive or not. You can see. You can see the ones nodding off. You can see the ones looking out the window. You can see. But here it says that all the people were attentive. They were hungry. They wanted to hear the word that was being preached. It's not Tracy's word. It's God's word. It's what the Holy Spirit is saying. Lord, speak to me. I want to hear from you this morning. Change me. What are you saying to me? Give me a revelation. What can I How can I change? How can I be more of what you want me to be? And then I'll respond. All the people were attentive to the book of the law. Verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people for he's standing above them. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. That was their response. The word of God. Stand up. In some churches, when they, they stand, let's stand for the reading of the word. That's a sign of respect. It's not a religious activity. It's like oh, the word of God. Stand up. The people stood up. Verse 6, Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped God with their faces to the ground. That wasn't in worship. That was the, with the word, the reading of the word. They were like, wow, Lord, holy God. They lifted their hands. When, did you, when, do, when do we do that? Amen, yes. Lifting hands, not responding for anyone else, not for sure, but for God. They bowed their heads. They worshiped the Lord. We don't even do this in, in, with music, with their faces to the ground, making themselves low. And the people remained in their place. Verse 8, and they read the book of the law 
of God distinctly, faithfully amplifying and giving the sense so that the people understood the reading. The people wanted to understand. And then when they heard the reading, I'm just going to paraphrase it. Verse 9, the people wept when they heard it. They were cut to their heart. They were, they were like, oh, Lord, we need, to, we need to change. They got a revelation. They heard something from the Spirit. And they wept. And verse 12, then basically um, they told, don't weep, don't cry, etc., etc. Verse 12, they go, they understood the words that were declared to them and they go away rejoicing. So there we just see a whole lot of stuff. The people were responding to revelation. They were responding to the word of God. That's worship. That's congregational worship. And I didn't make that up. That's in the Bible. Nehemiah 8. Okay, so congregational worship, it involves everybody. There's no spectators. When we come here, we need to be as one man. You know, the Bible says that one can set, can put a thousand to flight and two can send the legions fleeing. There's a power in agreement that I, I don't know if we fully grasp the, full, the fullness of it. If my husband and I just agree, we haven't prayed, but we agree on something, we see it happening. And then we'll be like, sure, we didn't even pray. We just agreed. So when we come together and we agree it's so powerful in the spirit. Yes, worship is for God, but he doesn't really need our worship. I think we need it more than he does. And as we worship, it's a powerful weapon of war in the spirit realm. And as we do it together and we do it when we've been living our lifestyle as worship, when we do our intentional acts of worship, then we come, we all participate corporately. And now we offer worship that's true and it's in spirit. It's powerful. It's powerful. You know, I wasn't going to share this story this week. I'm going to share the full story next, next time. But this week I had an experience, an encounter with a spirit of witchcraft. And the Lord gave me a strategy. And he said, remember Jehoshaphat, you're going to pray and you're going to worship because that's incense going up before the throne. And basically I, I, I did that. And it's literally after doing that. I hadn't even done it for an hour. Literally, the spirit, it went away. I didn't have to confront it again, again, at all. And it was intense for two days. And that's one person. That's worship from one person. Now the Bible says one can put a thousand to fight, two can send the legions fleeing. And what about a whole congregation? When we're in agreement, the power of worship, we, I think we have weapons, we have power that we're just not aware of. We're just not aware of it. And it's, yeah, anyway, that's enough. Number four, individual worship and congregational worship inform and, and strengthen one another. So when I come to church and I worship with music and I hear the word, it strengthens me for my individual worship at home. And my individual worship at home, when I come, it strengthens the body and it strengthens what happens here. Hebrews 10 verse 24 to 25 says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. There's a power, there's a strengthening, there's an encouragement that happens when we come and we worship together. You know, many of us live our lives, and I said this a little bit earlier, we live our lives as if God doesn't see. And we live our lives as if, if I'm not a worshiper through the week. All I have to do to become a worshiper is walk through that door and present myself before the band, and I'm a worshiper. And I'm changed into a worshiper for two hours on a Sunday, and then I go home and I repeat the cycle. Do we honestly think that that's what makes us a worshiper? It doesn't make us a worshiper. We're either a worshiper or we're not. You either, I, I said this to someone the other day, you're either an empty space, a pew warmer, or you're not. In my freezer, I've got these ice cream containers and they have like maybe one spoon of ice cream in them, but it's a big container and they irritate me because they take up space in my freezer that I could use for other things and I want to throw them out. Okay, but we can be like that in church. We, we take up space. We use up oxygen. <laughs> okay, we don't con 
contribute anything. We pew warmers. We don't bring our worship from the weak and contribute. And it takes the power that's, that, 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 that can be manifest here in our worship and the glory and just stuff that God wants to do and the pleasing aroma to Him. When everybody brings, brings their parts, there's something so beautiful and special. There's something so special. You matter. You matter. Every single person in here, you matter. Your worship matters to God. It matters to everybody else in the congregation, whether you come prepared or not. I tell you something, if most of the people come in unprepared and unfocused, it affects the worship when we get started. We can feel it. Band, can we feel it? You can feel it. It's like revving up. We've been here since half past seven worshiping. We like... We're sensitive. We can feel it. Then, then, then some people come and it doesn't happen every time, but sometimes it happens and it's like you have to like crank things up. Three praise songs just to get people to focus and then it's time up. <laughs> so guys, come on. Okay. When you walk through that door, be prepared. Okay. Because the places we can go in God. Okay. I've lost my. Say, I will. Come to church, prepared, bringing my worship. Thank you. Okay. If I come to, if I'm not living my lifestyle of worship, and if the if what I express on Sundays is not somehow expressed during the week, that is not worship and truth. That is hypocrisy. I can't see it. Maybe we can feel it. But we can't look and say, well, it's you and you and you. No, we can feel it. But God knows. And we read those scriptures the first Sunday about God saying, please stop your sacrifices. Stop your festivals. Stop your prayers. I'm tired of them. They're wearying me. I hate them because you're being hypocritical. Okay, we want to be true worshipers that please the Father, worship in spirit and truth. And you know what? The whole body is affected. We, everybody matters. The whole body is affected. If I don't come ready, if you don't come ready, people, everybody is affected. Okay, number five, corporate worship is expressed as a community. So when we come to church, the purpose of, ch of worship in a church is worship expressed together as a community. We us it's our worship to God it's not my worship or to me source worship because he's leading and it's not I come to church and I'm now going to have my quiet time that will keep me going for the whole week because I'm busy and I'm having my own personal uh, quiet time worship my own personal intentional act of worship but just in a geographical location with everybody else that's not the purpose of corporate worship. I don't come and have my own individual time of worship in a corporate setting and it's just different because I'm in the same geographical location as other people. No, that's not the purpose of worship. You have your worship at home. I have my worship at home. I come to church and we worship as a community. We worship as a community. And when we do that, it changes the, nature, the words of the songs that we sing. I, 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 me, 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 my, my, my. It's not about I, 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 me, 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 my, my, my. It's about us. It's about God. It's about something much bigger than just me and my experience. This is another thing. You know, people come to church and they'll comment and they'll say, yeah, well, you know, the worship, I just didn't feel it. Well, baby or honey, the worship wasn't for you. Actually, it was for God. And if you didn't feel it, well, tough luck. It never was meant for you. That's not God's definition of worship. We can't come to church to meet our needs. It's not about me. It's just not about me. I'm just not that important. It's actually about God. I come and I worship, and because of the nature of God, He meets my needs often. Maybe not all the time, but it's not about my needs. It's not about my favorite song, and did they sing my favorite song, and did they do my favorite harmony, and did... No. Did they do that song that I hate? It's not about you. It's just not. Okay? When we come together, it's not about my dreams, me, my... This whole thing of narcissistic Christianity I was talking about earlier, it's crept into the way we do songs and worship as well. 
where it's become about the congregation, it's become about people feeling something, where it's become about drawing people and making sure that everybody's happy and did we, you know, did people feel touched and God does that because he loves us, but that's not the purpose. And if I didn't get touched, well, that's just tough luck. You know, I come and I bring everything of me because that's what I do for God. And then he pitches up and you know what? Maybe I get met, my, my needs get met. Maybe they don't get met. But somebody would have got blessed. And I need to rejoice with your, you and your rejoicing. You know, if I don't get a prophetic word, if I don't get a, you know, whatever, fall on the ground, whatever people want, it, it, somebody else might, and that's fine. We need to discern the body. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine talks about discerning the body. Okay, discerning the body with the body of Christ. And we need to understand needs. We need to um, just care for one another. There needs to be more love in our worship. Okay, which leads me on to my next point. Corporate worship requires that we prefer one another in love. Philippians 2 verse 1 to 4. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirits, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord. There we go again. One accord in agreement. No spectators of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit oh it's so loud oh oh why do they it's not about you nothing done through selfish ambition or conceit but in lowliness of mind each esteem each others better than himself let each not only look out for its own interests but the interests of others this is the heart when we come together to worship corporately we care for one another we care for one another Paul says, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. What is he saying? Some of our personal needs will be better met at home in our own private worship times. We have to come and discern the body. What gift are you sitting on that God wants to use in you for the body? You know, when God gives us a gift, it's not for us. If God gives me a gift, it's not for me. It's not mine. I'm a steward of it, and he gave it to me for the body. If you sit on a gift, it's not for you, and it's not your gift. You're stewarding it for God, and it's for the body. Do you come to church on Sunday, and God wants to use you to touch someone? He wants to use you to give an encouraging word. He wants to use you to hug someone. He wants to use you to give someone a prophetic word. What does God want to use you to do on Sundays when we come together? I'm talking about our corporate gatherings. We need to step out. You know, the, the, the fivefold ministry is given for the equipping of the saints that they can do the work of the ministry. The person standing up here is not the only person who's supposed to do ministry, the, per, the people on the stage. It's supposed to be everybody discerning the needs of the body, loving each other, ministering according to the grace that we've been given, pouring ourselves out for each other. And it's not the time to come and substitute my personal worship time at home, which is not happening at church. That's not the, pur that's not the purpose of this time. Right. Okay. We do need to grow up. I've said here in my notes, we need to grow up as Christians. We do need to grow up and come to a place where we're not so self-absorbed and selfish, but a place where we can discern the needs of the body. Do I have needs? Yes. Do you have needs? Yes. Do I come to church every Sunday saying, I want this met? Well, it would be nice. I might pray, but it's not my focus. When I come, I'm like, Lord, what are you saying? What are you doing? How can we help people hear you? How can we get people to get a revelation of you? What do you want me to do, Lord? How do you want to use me? I'm yours, whatever, even if I look like a fool. Use me, Lord. Touch your people. Be glorified. How can we glorify you more, Lord? How can we get your people to do that more? How can we get your people to worship in spirit and truth? That's my heart. And in the process, yes, I get fully blessed. Yes, I get some prayers that I didn't even pray. I get answered. But my heart is, Lord, you, Lord, your people. And that should be all of our hearts when we come to church on Sunday, discerning. I can't come on empty and just be filled every time and be a space taker like those ice cream containers in my fridge. <laughs> I can't. And you can't either. We need you. Every single person, we need you. Okay? The seventh point, the substance of our worship is more important than the style or the form. The substance is always more important 
than the style or form. You see, the style or form is often just a reflection of our own prejudices, our own culture, our own preferences, how we grew up, what we're accustomed to, the type of music that we listen to anyway. That's not ultimately important. Do you think God has a preference whether you worship him with an electric guitar or an organ? Do you think he has a preference? What do you think he's listening to? He's listening. <laughs> he's not listening to a banjo. <laughs> He's listening to our heart. I was telling the guys at Bible school on Tuesday, I think in the spirit realm, there's a lot more sounds than we're aware of. Things in the natural make sounds in the spirit realm. Do you know that violence can sound in the spirit realm? It has a sound. My heart will have a sound in the spirit realm. My lifestyle will have a sound, will have a smell in the spirit realm. That's what God listens to. So our, the substance is always more important. Is my heart, is my lifestyle true worship? And this must also be reflected as we engage with other churches. I had the privilege of attending a number of different churches with different um, sort of forms of worship. And hey, there wouldn't be my preference in terms of going every Sunday. I wouldn't want to go to an organ service every Sunday. I wouldn't want to go to a liturgical service every Sunday where you, everything is read, like the word and pray and there's no music necessarily. I, that's not my preference. But if I look at it in terms of substance, in terms of is there revelation and, and an opportunity for response, yes, it's worship. Yes, it's worship. I'm no greater, I'm not no better Christian because we play piano than the guys in another church that use an organ, than the guys, the Anglican church in Irene, then do, they don't have any music, they do just litur liturgical service, just reading stuff in one of their services. I'm not, no better, no, it's just a different, it's a different expression of worship and we need to be gracious with one another. Be gracious with different people. If the style of the songs that we sing is not your personal preference, if you're a part of the church, well, sorry. It's not for you. This is it. If God says different, we'll do different. You know? But if you really don't like it, maybe you should find somewhere where you like the expression and where you can worship. But at the end of the day, you need to worship wherever you go. You need to worship wherever you go. Offering everything all of your heart to him okay the substance of the worship is more important because worship is about revelation and response this is why the words in our songs are so important so so important the words in our songs need to be doctrinally sound we can't sing to jesus like he's our boyfriend come on we can't that's nonsense he's the king of creation yes he's my friend but he's also father so creator of heaven and earth you know, and I can't just sing all, you know, I just don't think it's appropriate singing a lot of songs about me and what God is doing in me and love songs to me because it's actually about God at the end of the day. It changes the songs. And when you're using songs and music in your personal worship times, listen to the words because you know what happens. I'm sure it happens with you with catchy songs. The words just come in somehow. I don't even learn them. They just they there <laughs> and I'm singing along and I think. I didn't know I knew that song, but it's catchy and we end up singing and we form our doctrine by what we're listening to in songs. Not every songwriter is doctrinally sound. Come on, go there. So listen and be careful with what you, you know, there's a song that we do that we've done in our church and I've always had an issue with it. I struggle with it and it's, the tune is so catchy and for me, I'm like, they wasted those words on that song. Because I don't like the words. It's about me. He does this to me. He does that for me. You know, no, it's worship of God, not worship of me. Okay. So the substance is more important. Biblical preaching, songs of substance. And the songs may be old, they may be new, they may be hymns, they may be tr traditional, they can be African, they can be contemporary. It doesn't matter as long as they reveal the truth of God. We need songs that have substance and portraying God's attributes, his acts, his will, his words, his works, his ways, etc. So you songwriters out there, we need songs. Songs of substance. <laughs> okay? Careful use of personal testimony and spiritual gifts. This is also worship. And it's careful use of, of personal testimony because sometimes people use personal testimony as an opportunity to glorify themselves. <laughs> it's like, well, you know what happened to me and, you know, 
And also the devil, yeah, and you know, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened for five minutes, and then 20 seconds, and then God saved me. <laughs> Careful use of personal testimony and spiritual gifts, because your gifts are not for you, and they're not about you, they're for the body. Communion is an act of worship. Prayer, an act of worship. Confession, an act of worship. Reading of the word, an act of worship. Expressions of praise, singing, shouting, clapping, etc. Uh, all of those things, that's acts and expressions of worship. Presentation of tithes and offerings, worship. Any form of service that's done on Sunday is a form of worship. Okay? We need to be careful not to be critical of styles and of preferences. We need to be careful. Because God is not about that. It's for God, and he's not critical of that. And we can't be critics and worshipers at the same time. If you've got enough space in your head and your heart to be critical, you're not worshiping. Because you have to worship with all of your heart. Hey? All of our forms of worship should be submitted to the test of substance. Test of substance. Is God plainly revealed through the elements of the worship and the service? Are the worshipers assisted in responding to God? Different styles will have different strengths. And that's fine. That's why there are different churches. You can pick what strengths you like. Eight, worship is first and foremost for God and about God. It's for God and about God, first of all. Uh, 1 Chronicles 16, give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 29 verse 2, give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 45, the king will greatly desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Worship him. Psalm 86, all the nations whom you've made shall come and worship before you, Lord, and glorify your name. Psalm 138, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. The worship is for God because he is glorious and he is worthy, and we need to do it for him. And you know what? If you want to jump, because that's your expression of worship, and we're going to look at expressions next week, jump. It doesn't matter what Susie next door to you thinks. It's not for her anyway. Just don't knock her out. That's all. <laughs> okay. Ladies, if you've got to take off your shoes, take them off. I will become even more undignified. That's what David said. You have to do it. It's not for man. It's for God. Okay. Every church has the responsibility for worship, nurture, and outreach. Worship oriented towards God, nurture oriented towards other believers, and outreach toward people who don't believe. But the primary purpose when we come together is not nurture and it's not outreach. The primary pur purpose is worship of God. And then the other things happen out of the worship of God. Amen. Okay, sure. When shall I stop? <laughs> okay. Yo, yo, yo. Okay. I think the problem we have in the church today is well described by Isaiah. Their land is full of idols. This is Isaiah 2 verse 8. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made, that which their own thoughts have conceived, that which their own voices have made. Their land is full of idols. When we, don't, when we worship idols, we don't worship God. Jesus spoke about us not being able to have two masters. We'll either worship one or we'll despise the other. We have to worship God. G.K. Testerton, I started this series with this quote, when we cease to worship God, we do not worship nothing. We worship anything. But in the church, I think we find ourselves in the dangerous place where we think and we believe we're worshiping God. But actually, there's a lot of our own narcissistic tendencies mixed in there. And the sad thing when this happens is what is described in Psalm 135. I'm just going to go quickly through the rest of my notes. Psalm 135, basically from... Let me see where I'll read from. Verse 15. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. And this, listen to this, those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Those who make idols and bow down to idols are like the idols that they make. They're spiritually impotent, spiritually blind, spiritually deaf. 
So there's a blindness, spiritual blindness, a spiritual deafness, a spiritual impotence that we begin to walk into when we start to entertain idols in our life. That's very, very severe. That's very, it's, it scares me. It reminds me of what Paul says when he says in Acts, he's quoting from Isaiah as well, and he says, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear and not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. The ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that they can be healed. Jesus also quoted that scripture from Isaiah, by the way, the same thing. So I want to ask you this morning, just in closing, you can close your eyes. I want you to reflect on these questions as I ask you. Who is your life really about? Who is it about? Is it really about God? Is there a mix of you in there some way? Who is your worship really about? Is it about you? Is it about someone else? Is it about what other people may or may not think? Does that rule you? Does that stop you from doing things? Is it about God and what he wants? Under whose terms do you come when you come to worship? Do you come under God's terms or do you come with your own terms? Do you come with your own prerequisites? Or do you just come in spirit and truth according to God's pattern? Today we've seen that worship involves the participation of our entire being. It involves the participation of the entire church. We've seen that individual worship and congregational worship inform and strengthen one another. That they need each other. We can't rely on one without the other. It's like having one leg and trying to walk. Corporate worship is expressed as a community. It requires that we prefer one another in love. We've learned that the substance of our worship is more important than the style and that worship is first and foremost for God and about God. And as you just keep your eyes closed, I'm going to read the, the words for that song that was portrayed in communion. And then I'm going to lead us in a prayer at the end. It's a song by Jason Upton called Dying Star. It says, you've got your best man on the front side. You always show your best side. It's talking about masks, hypocrisy. And evil's always on the other side. And you say this is your strategy. But son, I hope you take it from me. You look just like your enemy. You're full of pride. He just sang this over me. He said, We better trash our idols if we want to be in the army of the Lord. You see, the greatest idol is you and me. We better get on the threshing floor. When will we learn that God's strategy is giving glory to the Lord? We better trash our idols if we want to be in the army of the Lord. Star, how beautiful you shine. You shine more beautiful than mine. You shine from sea to shining sea and worldwide is your strategy. But shining star, hope you see that if the whole wide world is staring straight at you, they can't see me. It's not about you and me. It's not our preference, about our preferences, our needs. It's not about what other people think. It's not about what we feel, what we're comfortable with. It's not about our terms, our requirements. If worship is truly about God this morning, then let it be about God. Let it be about God. And Lord, this morning as we come, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your work in our midst that you're wanting to raise up an army of true worshipers. And Lord, we express our response to your word. You respond however you want to respond. If you want to stand and say, yes, Lord, that's me. I want to be a true worshiper. You do that. If you want to respond and lift your hands, if you want to respond with your prayer, with a, with a sacrifice from your lips, you respond how you want to respond. But Lord, this morning we respond to you and we say, come and make us a worshiping uh, army of warriors, Lord. Worshiping warriors. Warriors who know how to worship in spirit and truth. Truth. Worshiping warriors, Lord, who worship with our lifestyle, who worship in our own private uh, secret closet, Lord. And yes, who come and worship corporately as well, discerning the needs of the body, pouring ourselves out for others, Lord. I pray, Lord God, and I declare a grace over our lives this morning that even as the word has been, has been preached, Lord, that the grace would follow to 
move us into this new season, Lord, a new season of worship and spirit and truth, a new season, Lord, where we're honest with you, where we're honest with each other, Lord God, where we participate with our entire being, where we participate with our entire body, not as spectators, but as participators. I pray, Lord, for a revelation of your holiness this morning as we go from here, a revelation of your greatness, of who you really are, Lord. And would you help us and teach us to respond appropriately. Worldwide is your strategy.